edition of the Kingdom War Room. I'm Dr. Michael Lake, one of the co-hosts of the show. I have with me today Dr. Mike Spaulding, my co-host and, and cohort in Kingdom Endeavors. And we're honored today to have Dr. Gregory Reed on the show with us. He is the Director of Youth Fire Ministries. He is a retired private investigator. He is also a criminal uh, justice trainer on occult crimes and is the author of three books, Trojan Horse, The New Age Corruption of the Evangelical Faith, The War of the Ages, A Complete Spiritual, uh, a spiritual Guide to Confronting and Defeating Satan's Kingdom, and Nobody's Angel, A Story of Satanic Abuse, Occult Bondage, and, Dece and Redemption. Uh, Dr. Reed, it's wonderful to have you on the show with us today. My pleasure. Thank you for having me on. You know, as, as we look about, and I really want to center in on, on this show, I mean, there's so many different ways we could go, but uh, your, your Trojan Horse book, uh, I had the pleasure of reading it before I, I got this bundle from you. You know, the evangelical Christianity has had a powerful impact on the, on the world historically. Uh, but in the last three or four decades, it has been under direct attack from the enemy. And I mean, the list, we had, we had communists invade the seminaries in the 1920s. We have Freemasons moving into leadership positions, both locally and nationally within the church. In fact, you'd be surprised how many seminaries whose uh, presidents are 33rd degree Masons. Uh, the New Age began invading, uh, the, uh, especially the charismatic movement, the late 1980s, 1990s. Uh, the Kabbalah, which is the Jewish version of, of the mystery religions, has made many inroads into the church in the past three decades. Add to that questionable Bible translations that are in wide use today in the church, and it has caused a sound doctrine to be tainted, and it has weakened the spiritual life of the believer. And, I mean, there's this, there's this so many avenues that we could go at, but, um, Greg, what, do you, what would you like to talk about today as far as centering it up on that, what's really going on in the church, and how that we can begin remedying a lot of this and returning back to a solid faith? Well, think about... Um, Back in when I first became a Christian, and I was uh, thankfully raised on the solid Word of God, nothing more, nothing less, and that uh, helped me to sharpen my sword and to know uh, truth from error. And early on, after the Jesus movement, I started to see some things coming in from different sides, starting to nibble at the stability of the church. And of course, being a, a young buck at the time, I didn't know that I had a right to say anything or should say anything and that uh then i went on until i think my mid or late 20s early 30s when i went to a conference that was headed up by uh, jimmy carter's sister who i had known through correspondence for quite a while and she had unfortunately gotten hooked up with a lot of new age teachers and so i kind of unfortunately fortunately blew up that conference because i got in the middle of it and there were some of the top leaders in the evangelical world at that conference listening to a guy say that the bible contains the words of god and talk about god whoever you think he or she is and when he got i just bit my tongue until a private men's meeting when he told them all that uh, jesus was he, he could cuss better than a, you know longshoreman and that he was married to mary magdalene and i just stood up and i said you sir are a false prophet I am not going to sit here and let you lie to these men. And it shredded the meeting, but it was my first clear indication of how far into the evangelical movement some of these things had gotten. Surprised not much now at what's happening, maybe the depth of it, how quickly it's happened. Uh, we, uh, a friend of mine intercepted a document, was given a document, I think from 1983, in which someone mimeographed a newsletter uh, at uh, a little print shop and accidentally left it in the mimeograph machine in the copier. It was a five-page newsletter, one of the largest, uh, uh, it was Southern California, and it was from the high priestess of the entire Southern California region of the Wiccan world. And she detailed very clearly how they were infiltrating churches and, and where they did it. And she listed five or six churches where their pastors had become first level initiate Wiccans. That was 1983. So maybe we shouldn't be surprised that now we've got two or three Christian witchcraft sites on the internet. And um, the watchmen are starting to thin out that are going to actually stand up against us and say, 
no, this is wrong. And so we have the whole progressive church movement that is totally corrupting the young generation. You know, we, we have seen, you know, I, I have, I, I tell people I, I had to quit watching Christian television because I was going to run TVs. I was going to start throwing my shoes through them. And it also, I mean, bad on my blood pressure. Uh, I've actually caught one prominent charismatic minister, and I'm not going to say his name, but yeah, he, he was given this revelation of I was going, oh, this is wonderful. I'm thinking, he's quoting morals and dogma. Because in my research, when I had to research Masons, I've read Morals and Dogma, I've read Albert, you know, Albert Pike, and I've read uh, you know, several of their others that are, are key theologians, if you will, within the Masonic movement. And you start seeing their stuff all over the place, and I had to do the same thing with the Kabbalah and in my research. And I'm finding now Kabbalic teachings are, are all throughout the charismatic movement. And I, I, don't, I don't know, your, your background, are you spirit-filled, Greg? Or yes. are you, okay. Uh, you know, we know as, as spiritual men, there are, there are ebbs and moves to the Spirit of God. And sometimes the Holy Spirit will pull back, and we don't realize it's a test. I'm going to test you to see whether you're going to obey me or not, whether you get Holy Ghost goosebumps or not. And what they did to keep the machinery running, they just went to another spirit. And we, we have the Kundalini spirit going on in parts of the church. We have... Uh, we have Masonic spirits going on in different aspects of the New Age. Uh, and there's no discernment in the body. You know, I've, I've been spirit-filled since 1978. And so some of the old guard would have shut down many of the meetings that we have today. They would have called and said, you're not moving by the Spirit of God. This is a demon. Oh, by the way, come here because I'm going to cast that thing out of you. This is what the old guard would have done. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. I kind of touched on that yesterday uh, during our gathering of the, of the Ecclesia. Um, I love A.W. Tozer, love everything that he he taught and stood for. Uh, Raven Hill, uh, Red Path, all, all of the old of the old guard, Mike, and, and you're absolutely right. The things that they were calling out back in the 50s and the 60s, um, we're, we're seeing come to fruition right now. They sounded the alarm, but, but the Ecclesia wasn't paying attention or or maybe they decided that it was more important to count noses and and uh, watch watch the, the finances grow than to, to stay true to the word of God. So everything you guys are saying um, is is that there was a, a, a very deliberate strategy to undermine the word of God to to. Well, displace it actually with with the words of men. Well, I think you have that, and I know uh, Greg has written about many of the the uh, the weird translations are out there. One of the ones I have the biggest problem with is called the Message Bible. You know, if you guys have that one, just throw it in the trash can. Yeah, yeah, that's hard for people to see what's wrong with it. But my my friend Warren Smith that wrote the book. Um, Siege on Purpose, uh, tremendous writer, and I've just gotten to know him, and I was just, I didn't expect to get into this area of ministry. I've, I've been in two or three different, you know, pioneering type things over the years, and then the Lord moved me out into something else, but I didn't expect to be doing what I'm doing now, because the work previous to this, which I still do, is really exposing satanic crimes and, you know, occultism within the church. But when I kind of took a break from all of that uh, and all this information started to come to me, I realized this is we've been infiltrated. Well, I've been out there doing this thing. This is coming to the church. And so I still didn't know where it was all coming from. So when the message came out, when it first came out, I read some of it. I thought, well, this is OK, but it just doesn't feel right. And then they got the big version and, you know, whole new and Old Testament I thought maybe this one will be better. It still didn't feel right. And so I got in touch through my friend Johanna Michelson with uh, Warren Smith and was talking to him. I said, what's the problem with it? And he said, well, I'm going to make it very simple for you. What does the Lord's Prayer say? Our Father who art in heaven, how would be thy name? Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He says, stop. Pick up the message. What does it say? He says, well, and my, my jaw just drops. says, as above, so below. Anybody who is familiar with any of the, the, the occultic religions, whether it's Masonic 
or it's any of the other ones, knows that that's the most powerful phrase in the whole occult world because it means uh, macrocosm, microcosm, God and man are equal, all of that. And I thought, well, there's only two possibilities here. Either Dr. Peterson didn't know what he was doing when he wrote that and was used by some demonic force, or even more chillingly, he didn't know what he was doing. Either one was a big sign to me that with all the pastors across the country that were using the message, we had a huge problem to confront. Yeah. I caught a lot of Masonic phrases throughout the, the entire translation. It just made my head explode. Wow. And, you know, one of the ones uh, I thought was absolutely hilarious, if, if you want to call it hilarious, is when they called out Jesus for healing on the Sabbath. And he says, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath, which, but, but, which in context, what that means is I am proving that I'm Messiah because I'm healing on the Sabbath. That's what they had problems with. And the, the message Bible says, I'm no lackey to the Sabbath. Oh my. And, by, and so by, no, by Old Testament standards, you just made Jesus a false prophet. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And so it's just like, uh, we're, we're, we're so running in, you know, I, I tell people, you know, when, when you look up a translation, try to stick as close to the literal, uh, trans, tra you know, little translations, the King James, New King James, uh, the NASB, uh, some of those, it, uh, I warn against the NIV, the nearly inerrant version, you know, <laughs> and, and, and there's just a lot of other ones getting worse out there. They're, 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 they're actually coming out with the ones that are, uh, making God gender neutral. Let me tell you something. The old pagan gods, their sexuality was fluid. God is very distinct in who he is. And when you, when you begin doing that, you begin taking away the revel. The, this is a special revelation from God on who he is and his plan of salvation for us. The moment you begin straying away from that, you begin dealing with another God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the breaking down of it all has brought us to this point where we, you know, when people are so numb. Um, to how this has happened, you know, the progression over the regression over the decades. Um, I was shocked. I wish I had the reference right now, but I actually found in the Old Testament a, um, a king that was transgendered. And it just blew my mind. I mean, it said that he put on women's makeup and dressed delicately like a woman. Oh, so there's nothing new about all this. And that's, that's very... Um... When you deal with Ashtaroth or Anana, you know, she goes by a lot of different names, Diana, all, all their priests were transgender. Yeah. And so was, he was basically saying he was a priest with, for one of the, one of the goddesses mm -hmm. when he did that. And we, we, we lose the connection of all that. And, and guys, the, there's nothing new under the sun. It's always been there before. The enemy hates the word of God. He hates, he, he does not want you to have sound doctrine. Because when we deal with spiritual warfare, and, and I'm, I'm sure, Greg, that you, do, you, you understand this too, that if, you, if your doctrine is off, you are vulnerable spiritually. Mm -hmm. And it puts you in very, very poor footing for spiritual warfare. Yeah. And it's the, I, I believe the Song of Solomon said, the little foxes spoil the vine. And it was the little nibbling at doctrine things that started to... And I think the enemy's been very effective in two ways. First of all, he has um, taken away the, the, the strength of the foundational doctrines. Uh, you know, the, the second coming of Christ, the prophetic fulfillment, the place of Israel, the, the uh, virgin birth, the resurrection of Jesus, the inerrant word of God. On one camp and the other one, we're fighting over little things. Um, I mean, I refuse to get involved in the pre-trib post-rapture thing anymore because I realize people are killing each other over that. I've studied it for many years. I have my feelings about it. I have my proof texts about it, but I also know there's some good legitimate uh, counter -ar arguments. And on the other hand, there's the Calvinist versus Armenian argument, which right now is kind of a, a renewal of Christians slaughtering each other over that one. And I just tell people I'm a Calmenian, so they'll leave me alone. <laughs> but, you know, the, the, but, but those foundational doctrines have been so torn at that it's easy for these um, apostates to come in claiming to be 
uh, ministers or preachers and say, well, this is really what God said. And you know, we talked about homosexuality. You didn't understand the language uh, and, and all of that. And a younger generation of Christians who has been taught not to study the scriptures, uh, but just to see whatever translation is thrown up on the screen for 3.5 seconds. Uh, they don't have the capacity to discern because discernment is not only a gift, uh, but it's also a muscle, according to Hebrew, that needs to be active. And so if we're going to turn this around for another generation, uh, we have to get off of the, the games and snacks bandwagon of youth ministry and train these kids up to fight the war that, that's coming because it's otherwise we're going to lose a whole generation. Yeah. Yeah. The average, uh, what I'm finding is the average pastor doesn't know the, the principles of proper biblical interpretation, much less this congregation. True. And, and, you know, I've, I've done conferences to where I've taken bishops that were, you know, 8,000 on Sunday morning, 800 pastors underneath them, and taught them how to use the back of their Strong's Concordance and use the lexicon. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. and that, that's, you know, I learned that when I was 13 years old in a Baptist church. Uh, the pastor came through and said, hey, I got a deal on hardbound uh, Strong's Concordance. We can get them for $14. I bought one for every family of the church. Everybody in the, everybody in the church owes me $14. Come get your Strong's Concordance, and I'll teach you how to use them. I mean, that that's just the way it was. And yeah. and, and today, um, the, the the we have more access. You know, it's like I've got these books behind me on my, on my computer with logos. I have almost 15,000 references available to me without a push of a button wow we have all of this and yet we are the most biblically illiterate generation that i have ever seen yes we are absolutely so what so so that begs the question gentlemen what what spirit is is leading them what voice are they listening to and what's happening in the pulpit of those ecclesias where this is not being taught this is this is Ecclesia 101. How do you study the, the, the scriptures so that you can receive uh, the revelations of the Father? It, listen, we make jokes and have done so over the years about, well, just stick your Bible under your pillow and sleep on it at night, and it'll just, you know, by us, it'll just transfer. Well, that's not how it works. It's, it, it's, it's, it takes work. It takes effort. It takes illumination, enlightenment by the Holy Spirit. But it's what we're called to do is apply ourselves to understanding the word. of and there's, a, and there's a point in doing all that, right? So that we might be witnesses that will share Christ and, and disciple other people. We should be, dis, every one of us should be discipling somebody. And might I also add, gentlemen, it doesn't matter how long in the tooth or or or, or thin on the top or, or gray in the beard you become, somebody should be pouring into you. You should have people that are pouring in. I've got brothers like like uh, Michael Lake that I know that I can pick up the phone if I've got a concern, yeah, if I've got an issue that I'm looking for some some solid biblical counsel. Mike's going to be there for me. And there are other gentlemen as well, uh, brothers in the faith. But we all need that from above, and we all need that. We need to be pouring into people that we're discipling. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. And, and if we if we need that, and we do, and it's it's been especially this last two years, a lot of my elders uh, gone to be with the Lord, which um, a little disconcerting, frankly. But if we need it, uh, where we're at, how much more? does the next generation need but you cannot give them what they need in a short period of time once a week uh where you give them you know games uh a, a couple of songs and you know two or three point minute jesus snack. it doesn't work it has to be real I, i'm thankful that the man that led me to the lord he was a little fireball that you know took this little 15 year old punk kid that had just been involved in every range of the occult you can imagine and then unfortunately took me out uh, on the field to do uh, evangelism. And I was telling people, you know, all paths led to God and there's no such thing as heaven and hell. 
one of the other guys a little more mature caught that and brought me back to our house to leave with Dave. And he was all, he was loaded for bear. He had the Bible. He says, come over here, Greg. I want to show you something. And I said, what? I said, what does this say? Uh, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except for me. Does that mean there aren't more than way, one way to heaven? Is there? Said, well, what's your point, Dave? And he went through two or three scriptures. I was so mad. I was so angry at him. But he fought, I'll never forget him pointing directly, put his little finger in my chest and said, you either believe all of this word or you don't believe any of it. Because Jesus is either Lord of all of your life or he's not Lord at all in your life. And I got mad and I went away and I wrestled with it. God revealed the truth. There was no going back to me. I needed this word. Uh, it was life. It was a sword. It was a balm. It was everything. You know, when people start to divide Jesus, the word of God, from the written word of God, they get into real trouble because you cannot do that. In the beginning, it was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And if anybody ever doubts that, truth of the word of God and its power, sitting on a deliverance meeting with somebody that's doing real, real exercise. And all you have to do is pick up this book and listen to these things scream. They hate it so much. If they hate it, well, I'm going to cherish it and use all of my might. Absolutely. You know, the, the modern church, there are, for those of you out there that, I mean, there's five basic steps to understanding the word. Context, you know, the, the old thing in real estate, location, location, location. You know, you know, context, what was he talking about? You can't take snippets here and there and then sew this thing together. You have to look at language, you have to look at geography, you have to look at history, you have to look at these things so that you can properly understand. And the church is lazy that they don't want to do it. it just, let me let me sew these two or three scriptures together. If you look at them sideways, it'll really please your flesh and it'll draw in a crowd and get you a big offering. That is a way to send an entire group. I don't care how big you build the church, you can, you'll can end up sending them all to hell. Because anytime you come up with a Jesus that does not line up with the word of God, it's an idol. And you'll have another spirit come in there to confirm that. I, I think the Holy Spirit in a lot of places have been has been replaced by a Kundalini spirit. Oh, yes, absolutely. And I became aware of some of that um, kind of in the beginning. I had gone to, when I was 16, I went to a little private meeting with a private Christian counselor um, that, that I was recommended by a friend of mine, and I thought, great, I can go to a counselor and have a little prayer meeting. And as this guy, he opened up the meeting by saying, first thing we're going to do is we're going to close our eyes, and we're going to imagine a rose in our minds, and then we're going to open up this rose we reach 20. And so I, you know, I'm already in, you know, so, and somewhere around counting to 10, I just stopped. I said, I stopped. And he says, what's wrong? And I said, I'm feeling cold. He says, well, that's the presence of the Holy Spirit. I said, you know what? That's just not true. I know the Holy Spirit. This is not from God. He says, oh, I guess we'll have to close the rows. I said, I'm not closing any rows. I'm closing the door. I'm getting out of here. And I realized that there was a counterfeit spirit. And, you know, I mean, there's no doubt when the Holy Spirit touches you. Yes, you feel it. It's an emotion. But the counterfeit can be so close to that but i think we have a culture that is so felt needs oriented yeah that people will tend to say and i've heard this so many times well i don't know if that's true or not but i know that it felt right or i don't know you know there's a lot of controversy about some of the new um, uh, gospel evangelical movies that are coming out you know and i try to point out that they're actually being paid for by cults they're like, well, I don't really care because they make me feel good. They've renewed my relationship with God. I went through this whole thing with the shack when it came out. I lost pastor friends who basically said, I don't care what you're telling me, what you think is wrong about the book. I have a new relationship with God because of it. I'm like, well, when you sacrifice truth for what you feel, then that's the first big open door. And we saw that start to manifest in a greater way. I suppose probably I saw it in a huge way. And by the way, I don't know that a lot of people know this, but I've got pretty good uh, evidence that uh, Jim Jones, 
was actually an asset for one of our intelligence agencies. Yep. That uh, People's Temple was experimental crowd control uh, situation. So I was very keen knowing that. So when a gentleman came into our town and had over a thousand people at the Civic Center, uh, dozens of pastors running around in a circle, laughing their heads off, falling on the ground, babbling incoherently, I thought there is something so drastically wrong with this. This is a guy that called himself the Holy Spirit bartender, um, dispensing drinks to the Holy Spirit. But I saw as an observer uh, that there were three people in back of this guy at all times, all dressed in black with, a, you know, scary glasses and stuff. And I actually heard Cam's laughter going on in the background during him preaching. Same little voice over and over again, very quietly laughing. I thought, this is planned. This is programming. Uh, this is not from God. And people just don't have the discernment to call it what it is. Yeah. Well, the Dalai Lama had the exact same manifestations. And who is an adept in the mystery religions? If you don't see it in the word, how about let's just not do it? Amen. Amen. And guys, to, to help equip you, and I'm going to put in a plug for uh, Greg's books. Uh, the first one, let me get it up here on the screen. My mic's in the way and I can't do this right here. It's called The Trojan Church. You guys need to get this book. Thank you, Mike, and, and, and go through this. The second one, outstanding book on basic spiritual warfare and really understand the dynamic of what's going on. It's The War of the Ages. Both of these books need to be uh, in your in your library, and don't just have them in your library. Read them, because they're going to help equip you for the battle. You know, you can you know you can look back at Mike Spaulding's library and say, boy, he really looks smart because he has all these books. Well, the reason he looks smart is because he is smart because he's read them all. Okay. You've got to have your library. Mike, I think you're, uh, you've turned your mic off. I, I did. I was, yes, thank you for that. So somebody <laughs> asked me that question recently. They said, boy, that's a bunch of books. Have you read them? I said, yeah. I've, I, I now I'll confess I haven't read, you know, front to back in every one of them. But yes, that book's been cracked and I've absorbed and, and, you can probably see right there. There's a good. There's a good set right there. R. A. Tory. Yes. That's a good set right there. I would encourage people then. And and over here, I've got all the folks. The 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 uh, uh, the Leonard Ravenhills, the Alan Redpaths, the A. W. Tozers. All of those folks that 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 really you go back and and they've stood the test of time. Some of these some of these modern guys that are. And I'm not going to name any names, but but you know them. They're social media darlings. Uh, they're heretics, is what they are. Don't yes. put any stock. In fact, run from them. Get back. What was it? Jeremiah chapter six, when the Lord said to His people, "Get on the old paths and stay there." And they said, "What? Nope. We want to follow all the new stuff, all the heretical stuff." There's a word of encouragement for you who joined us today. Get back to what has stood the test of time. Mike? Yeah. No, I was getting ready to share this old one here. I've, uh, oh, yes. broke the, I've, I've used this many, many times. The Krishna Complete Armor wrote in 1662. Yes. Uh, there's meat to it. I know uh, when here a few years back when Tom Horn asked me, you know what, he has his uh, research library that they have the, those real big eight, eight and a half by 11 paperbacks. He said, uh, why would you recommend that I publish? And I said, strong systematic theology. And although he tend to be a little Calvinistic, that's okay. You know, a little Calvinism won't hurt you. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it, it, it took three volumes to publish it all because it was so big, but there's, there's a lot of meat. Whenever I'm, when I'm really, really hungry spiritually, I've got to go back a century or more. Now that, that's, that's telling you the state of the church. I've got to go back a century or more mm -hmm. to find really, really good stuff. Yeah. And, and I, I think it's vital that we not only have those, 
but do we find new ways to make them available? I mean, I'm I'm old school. I'm into reading all of my life. I've got a pretty outrageous library. Uh, and but I realized part of the strategy of the enemy was to erase from this generation uh, the desire, in some ways, the ability to read books. And I had I've had to make adjustments. And right now I'm in the process of really doing two things. My own pastor, Rick Howard, who's you know kind of a, a an unknown but well known preacher around the world, had a body of work that was extraordinary, over three thousand messages. And uh, at his old church, before they could move him over, they found one of the staff members throwing all these cassette messages into the garbage. And so I've, I've taken upon the almost impossible task of uh, turning all of those messages into MP3s because it's 30 years or uh, close to 50 years of ministry that is powerful, that is dynamic, that is grounded. And the other thing is I've been uh, asking the Lord to give me the time and the, the way to, to um, do audio books myself, knowing that uh, if we're going to be able to get a hold of, ahead of this thing, we have to make it available on that format for this generation because they're not going to read books anymore. I wish we could reverse the clock on that. We may or may not be able to, but if we can't, I want to be able to put those tools in their hands so that they will be able to hear the truth if they won't read it. And there's there's drawbacks to the Kindle. I know that I've, all my books are available on Kindle, and I've got one simply because the older I get, the smaller the print becomes on the pages for some reason or another. People keep on washing my books and shrinking the print. Uh, yeah. One of the things that they have discovered about the human brain, the brain, you can't fool the brain. The brain knows the minute that you swipe that page, that page is going to change. And so retention from a, like a Kindle book, a digital book, is like 3%. Wow. Because wow. your brain knows that it's transient. And, Interesting. And I, I'm just old school enough that I, I like to be able to highlight, mark them up, stick sticky notes in them. You know. <laughs> I'm laughing, Mike, because uh, my oldest daughter, Angie, she said uh, I had given her a book to read. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, she was on a little bit of a vacation last week, so she was reading through it. And she texted me and she said, um, "Is it, did you loan me this book or did you give me this book? And I knew immediately what she was saying. You're dying to underline and highlight in that book, aren't you? And yes, that's what it is. I said, go for it. I'll get another one. Well, guess what? She apparently did because... She sent me a copy of that book that arrived in the mail today. So, so my daughters understand the importance of reading and, and underlining and highlighting so that you can chew on and meditate on, and, and especially when it comes to the scriptures, right? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's how it gets in deep. And Greg, this will bless your heart. The first year of the Watchman I went to, and this was what, about five, maybe five years ago, with my first book, The Shine Our Directive, now it's kind of a weighty tone, okay? Uh, I had an 11-year-old kid walk up to me, and it was highlighted on every page. He had sticky notes coming out of all of it. He walked up to me and said, I've got a couple of questions I want to ask you. <laughs> and his dad had a smile on his face from here and said, that's his book. That's his notes. Wow, that's awesome. And he, yeah. I mean, he was asking questions. I was thinking, you're getting what adults that have read that book aren't getting, uh, which which kind of gave me hope for the next generation. I, I think that we're going to, you know, in the 60s, right before the Jesus movement, uh, it, it was a it was a decade of satanic rebels. It's, it's a, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. That's that's a satanic rebel. Okay, no matter that's what Ali Esther Crowley would have called it. They push people so far away from God people began to be desperate for God, which spurred the entire Jesus movement. I believe we're on the verge of seeing that again. I do too. And I, do. I, th I think that's why, you know, Greg, I think that's why God's having you write the books that you're writing. That's why all of us, God is having us write the books and doing the things we do because we're supposed to prepare this next generation that's awakening to take their generation. Absolutely. I absolutely believe that. And I've often wondered why. I mean, I think the year between years between 86 and 95 for me were probably some of or 
98 were some of the most difficult I have ever battles I've ever had because we went toe to toe with the enemy on uh, satanic crimes and kids involved in the occult. And the backlash against us was so profound that we went from a network of approximately 250 people nationwide to now we're down to about five. Uh, and it was very deliberate. Uh, it was very planned and it was extremely effective. And so when I felt like I was being called back in to uh, rewrite the, the history that they had rewritten, to write the true history and to expose this nonsense for what it really is, called my friend, because uh, my brother always used to say, you know, why don't you just paint a big red X on your chest and go outside? Because it seems like you're always doing stuff like that. And, you know, I confess, I mean, when I was a kid, we had a wood patch outside of our house and I was always taking a stick it was in there. My mom came out one day and said, son, don't do that. There's snakes in there. I said, okay, mom, and waited until she went back in, kept poking it because I wanted to bash a little snake head in. Um, and I, I never liked that. Day, but, you know, now that this, is, this has been real time and I lost so many of my friends, who were either completely discredited uh, wrongly and wrongly accused or died or lost loved one that I called one of my best friends from Bible school. And I thought, I, he knows about me writing this book. I said, have I just lost my mind? I mean, I used to be 35 and full of fury and arrogance and, you know, ready to tackle the world. I'm, you know, I get up in the morning and I'm a box of Rice Krispies, you know, snap, crackle, pop. What am I thinking? Yeah. But I think it's one of those, as much as the phrase has been misused, it's for such a time as this. And when I turn on the TV and find that the person, the doctor that, that Biden has, has put in place to handle the monkeypox thing is a hardcore devil worshiper, are you kidding me? Where is the church? These people aren't going away, and they've gotten just arrogant enough to think, well, they've shut up us Christians. Well, there's a whole generation of youth out there that has really yet to hear the pure, undiluted, fiery truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this is a time for everybody. I don't care if you're 15 or, or 80 to get on board and reach that generation. This is the last best hope before Jesus returns of reaching the world for Jesus. Yeah. Now it's not the time to retire. It's this time to be able to lift up that next generation on our shoulders and say you guys need to you guys need to know what we know and then take it and take that and proclaim that truth to a whole new level. Amen. Get refired, not retired. That's right. Amen. Amen. Well, so um, that's a monumental task. Others. It it is because the enemy it seems like they have almost unlimited resources. And they have the ear of the media. They, they, in fact, I think a lot of them are the gatekeepers, to even Christian TV. Yes. And so that's why we have to have platforms like this with all the things that we're doing, all of our podcasts, uh, even with the new strategic remnant learning center is, and my, my thing is don't hold anything back. If we have to pick people up out of the floor, we have to pick them up out of the floor, not because they were slain in the spirit but because the truth hit him upside the head to the place they couldn't stand up anymore yeah. uh, it, it's time to do it it's time to get very blunt well that's coming uh mike did you want to say something about the uh the event in october um we sold out in, in three days which really blew me away uh it's going to be on october 2021st mike and i and, and mary lou are going to be speakers and uh, we're going to be recording everything so that as soon as the conference is over, I'll begin the task of uploading all six sessions to the Internet. Everything that we produce is going to be made free to the public. And we're going to have the time that we need. Uh, each speaker is going to have 90 minutes. So that we can go as deep as we can go, as well as having a lot of time just interacting with the people. I've got a lot of downtime so that we can uh, talk with the people, find out what they're going through. Uh, because you know you, you you have to smell like sheep. If you're a shepherd, you got to smell like sheep. You know? <laughs> yeah. And 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 to pray for people and just have times of fellowship too. But guys, you know, I'd, I was I was reading Spurgeon the other day. I went back through his uh, letters to his students, 
And uh, the one that jumped out at me is when he called them all to prayer and fasting because he saw a time where the average Christian would not tolerate a decent sermon of two hours or more. Right. Well, that'd be today. <laughs> you know, that was 20 <laughs> minutes or more. I, I actually had one pastor mock me because my sermon was longer than his entire service. Wow. 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 M mocked you. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And uh, another guy chimed in and said, yeah, but uh, uh, how strong are your believers? You know, it, it comes to that. How strong are we in the faith? Yes. We're too touchy-feely. You know, when, when Jesus, when I was reading through Deuteronomy and, you know, you know God, it, it, Moses said, listen, God tested you and he tried you to, so, so that you could see what was in your heart and, and to see that and you would learn the lesson that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That's the word that Jesus used with Satan when he said, if you be the son of God, command these stones to become bread. And he's saying, listen, I've already learned the lesson that they were supposed to learn in the wilderness. I know that I'm going to live on the word of God. Well, if we're supposed to live on the word of God, that's our spiritual bread when we're not taking it in. What strength do we have in times of adversity? How do we hold up against the storm that the, the New Age and the Freemasons and all these different groups are constantly storming the castle, if you will, to bring down true Christianity and then we're not even feeding ourselves the word of God. We don't even know the word when we hear it. It's just what appeases the flesh. I find out what the word does a lot of times to my flesh. It makes it miserable. It calls for a hammer and nail and calls me to crucify it, not to make it, not to give it a warm fuzzy. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, that's why our, that's why our forefathers used to talk on and on and on and on and on about um, mortifying the flesh, yes. slay that flesh, because <laughs> until you do that, you are not going to have the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. You've got to make sure that you are completely surrendered. And that's another old, old concept, isn't it? Being completely surrendered to the Lord. Sold we used to out. call it sold out yeah. for, for, for Jesus. Uh, no, we just make time in our schedules now for Jesus on whatever day we happen to come together. And the rest of the time, you know, I can't, and I didn't coin this phrase, brothers, but, but I think it's very, uh, very apt. Um, moral therapeutic deism is, is what rules the church today. Moral therapeutic deism. So essentially what that means is we put God up on the shelf and when we need him, We'll go get him and pull him off, explain what our issues are, and then he can take care of that. And then we'll put him back up until the next life crisis comes. And that defines a lot of modern day Christianity, sadly. That kind of reminds me of, um, I think it was Donald Gray Barnhouse, who I think was uh, Walter Martin's mentor, was talking about the time that he had attended a, a party of rather liberal ministers. And, um, you know, they were, you know, just around talking and Dr. Barnhouse, a, a person approached him and said, uh, with some, um, a tray full of cocktails, you know, and drinks. And he said, would you like a drink, uh, Dr. Barnhouse? He says, let me check just a minute. And he took a cocktail and he lifted up the sky and said, Holy Spirit, would you like a drink? And it just <laughs> froze the rest of the room. <laughs> But it's that idea that, you know, if he's 24 seven, uh, I don't want to do things that are offending my Lord. Yeah, that's not a subject about it. That's not talking about alcohol. It's just talking about any little thing. And, and we're we know how to sort of eliminate the big 10 out of our life. But well, what happens when God starts, starts putting his finger on not just bad things we need to get rid of, but maybe some good things that God's saying, I need you to surrender this to me. You know, I don't think we're there yet, but I mean, I want that full surrender because that's really the only way to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. And it's the only way to really experience the fullness of all he is while we're in this life. Yeah, I think people have lost the concept of covenant. That covenant, you're either all in or you're all out. And the covenant, there's there's this reciprocity with covenant. That when I'm all in for God, God's all in for me. But guys, 
you know, the last thing you want to do is if you're trying to make uh, time in your schedule for God, when you're when your back is up against the wall, you better hope God doesn't have a conflict in His schedule. Mm. Amen. Amen. That's right. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. So, guys, get the books. These these are great for building your library anytime. Uh, and uh, Greg has a podcast that's called Extreme Times Truth in the Shadowlands. And look that up. That's another podcast that you guys can uh, uh, listen to. And I don't know if you ever had this happen to you, Greg. I went to one conference and this guy says, I hear voices all the time. <laughs> you know, he paused, you know, I'm, I'm raising my eyebrow. He says, I listen to your podcast all day long while I'm working. <laughs> <laughs> the pod, I, th I think podcastings are one of the, the modes that we can use to get this generation. They understand podcasts. Uh, they, they, they've been programmed to listen to talking heads, so what, we might as well be some of the talking heads, too. At least, at least we're talking truth. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I find that when I'm driving places, going to a fast food or whatever, someplace I see a young person, I just say, do you listen to podcasts? Yeah, here you go. And they're like, hey, thanks a lot. I mean, they're much more open to reading, to, to getting a podcast than they are maybe just a piece of literature. So this is a prime opportunity. And, you know, it was hard for me to make the jump to hyperspace. I had to have some younger people help me with the whole podcast thing. But I was able to get a card with an actually a QR code on the back. So all they have to do is snap it and right to the program. So we made it as easy as possible as we can. But kids, particularly younger people, they're very open to receiving something with a podcast on it. Yeah. So that, that, that's a good word for all of us old fogies. <laughs> yep. <laughs> that's all right. Yep. Well. Well, guys, I want to thank you for being on the show today. Thank uh, you. Guys, your, Greg, your books are a great resource. I think your podcast is going to be a great resource. This is a guy that, that has come out of the occult, that was had gotten into it, has come out and knows the tactics of the enemy. And uh, those are some of the ones that we need to listen to, that we need to pay attention to. And it's a gift to the body. Because unfortunately, when the Apostle Paul said, I would not have you be ignorant of his devices, the body of Christ says, oh yeah, I take that as a challenge. And it's, it's time for us to no longer be ignorant, but to become adept in understanding their ways so that we can tell the true from the false. All right. God bless you guys. Uh, we'll Thank see you. everybody next month. God bless you. Stay informed. Tune in to weekly podcasts by Dr. Michael and Mary Lou Lake to keep you informed, inspired, and empowered in the kingdom of God. Tune in to www.kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. This video was made possible by our partners worldwide. Please prayerfully consider supporting the ministry that is preparing the remnant for the unfolding of end times prophecy. Send your offerings to Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. That's Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri, 65746-0160. You can also donate online at store.biblical-life.com. That's store.biblical-life.com.